Good morning, church. I am Pastor Forrest, one of the pastors here at St. Stephen's, along with Pastor Rob and Pastor Gian. We are very happy that you're here with us to worship the Lord this morning. Uh, there's a few things I want to tell you. First is uh, there should be a Connect card that you got when you walk through the door with your bulletin. We ask that uh, everyone fills this out, whether you're a first-time person here, whether you are a long-time member or guest here as well. Uh, fill that out, and you'll put it in the offering plate as it comes around. It helps us to uh, know who's here. Uh, you can put anything that you need prayers for or joys uh, or the many announcements I'm about to run through. If you hear one that sounds very interesting to you, write it down, put your name, and we'll be able to contact you with some more information. So speaking of our announcements, uh, there's quite a few to get through today. Uh, first is we are coming to the end of the uh, the school year, really. So uh, that is, uh, you know, high school, college, master's, doctorate, whatever is, if there's anything past that, um, you super smart people. But we are asking uh, to send in anyone who you would wish to recognize as a graduate for our graduation Sunday, which is May 29th. The deadline is tomorrow. Um, so Karen might have a little bit of forgiveness and flexibility with you, but please try and get it in by tomorrow if you can. Going off of that, for some of our graduates, we'll be going on our summer mission trip, uh, Appalachian Service Project. Uh, we also have our Jeremiah Project, which is going to West Virginia. Uh, but they are having a fundraiser a car wash, and then while you wait as your car is getting washed by our wonderful youth, there's also going to be a bake sale where you can snack on some goodies and just chit-chat and have a good time. Uh, that is going to be this upcoming Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. right out here uh, in the backside of our parking lot, so you are invited to that. Uh, everything is donation only. Uh, this Wednesday, we have our special charge conference. Just so you know this, um, it is going to be at 7.30, so uh, if you can be in attendance. Uh, we also have coming up a blood drive. There are still openings. If you want to know more, you can find it in our emails or you can talk to Roger Hartman. Also, there is some very good news. Our uh, children's ministry has hired a new director of the program. Um, Devin Caldwell has been hired uh, and will start very, very soon. So we are uh, very thankful. Give it up for Devin and for filling that position. We are very excited about this. Uh, the church is still seeking a youth person um, to fill that role, but uh, are continuing to do so. So spread the word. But my friends, uh, that is all I have for our announcements this day. There is much that you may want to get involved in. There is much that you may have forgotten since I just spoke. Uh, I encourage you to put any of that in uh, or on your Connect card and put it in the offering plate. Or if you're online, there's that quick fill out on the online form. So my friends, I invite you now to pray with me. Lord God Almighty, this day we rejoice in who we are in the image of you. That we have been saved by the resurrected Jesus. May our lives reflect that. And may this time be glorifying to you, giving you all honor and glory so we may go out into this world changed, changed into who you've made us to be now and forevermore. Amen. St. Stephen's loves children, especially young children, and would like to recognize and celebrate their milestones. And today we dedicate the Bible and celebrate together with our kindergartners by giving them a Bible. Kindergartners, as I called your name, please come forward if you feel comfortable to do so or stand up where you are. And I'm going to keep my mask on because I'm going to be very close to you. Eli, Caleb, and would you come forward and stand facing me from the ground in the very center? Awesome. Congregation, these children have come to our church family as a special gift and blessings. 
so that God helps us to grow as we care and pray for them. They need your continued love, care, support, and the prayer as they grow up in faith. My young friends, Caleb and Eli, this is an exciting day. You're going to get the new Bible, right? You're old enough to read your own Bible, and I have them in this bag. Oh, yeah. And please know that your church family are so excited at your growing, and you have your own Bible to read. And we pray that God will guide you and your family with mommy and daddy and Nathan and Abby as you use this holy Bible in your home, your Sunday school, and your worship. And you ready to get your Bible? Okay, you can just stay there. I am coming to you. Eli, I give you this Bible to you and receive it with your hands, with your mind and heart. And remember that you are a God's precious child. You ready, Caleb? You stay there. Stay there? Okay, I'm going to stay there for Eli. And Caleb, receive the Bible with your hands, with your heart and mind. And remember that you are a very precious child of God. And it's heavy. You know what? The Holy Bible is heavy all the time because it has really many good stories, right? You're strong to carry. I know that. Okay, now we are going to pray all together. And mommy and daddy and all the church family, would you stretch your hands out to our precious children here so that we are blessing together? Let us pray. God, we thank you for this Bible and for the joy and strength that you give your children in their use. This morning, we give you thanks for your precious children, Eli and Caleb. Help them to hear, read, and understand your word, and find your love in this story and their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you turn around? I'm sure that they are going to clap your big milestone. Thank you. Now you, you can go back to your mind. That is Thank you, my friend. Continues with the song of praise. Please stand and sing with us as you're able. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy. Righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can see. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus led and suffered. For my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released, I can sing. I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home, and day by day, 
Thank you, Source Band, so very much. Well, welcome to week four of our worship series, Resurrection Walking, as we continue our study of the resurrection appearances of Jesus. And today our reading comes from the Gospel of John. As a group of disciples, knowing that Jesus has been raised from the dead, what do they do? They go to Galilee and they go fishing. So as we prepare our hearts and our minds to read God's word, let us join together in prayer. Let us pray for God's illuminating grace. Holy God, today as we read your holy word, may your glory and power be made known to us. We are Easter people because Christ is risen. He is alive. And where you live, Lord, life and light, freedom and salvation, hope and reconciliation break out. Penetrate our lives. Propel us to action. Invigorate our love. All praise and honor and glory be yours now and forever. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of John in the 21st chapter. We're reading verses 1 through 17. So fasten your seatbelts, folks. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he, he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. 
When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to them, to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. A visitor to Lake Braddock, I'm sure many of you have been to Lake Braddock, was watching a, a man fishing along the shore. The fisherman just sat there in his chair holding his fishing pole with a line connected to a, a little red and white bobber just floating motionless in the water. The visitor watched the fisherman for quite some time, but the fisherman just sat there hardly moving a muscle. Finally, the visitor walked over and asked, it doesn't look like there's any fish today, are there? Nope, said the fisherman, there aren't. Then what's the point of your fishing, the visitor said. The purpose, replied the man, is to show my wife that I have no time to cut the grass. Does anyone know perhaps this man? Now that's a rhetorical question. I might see some heads nodding a little bit in the congregation. But in our scripture lesson today, what is the disciples' purpose for going fishing? Lawn care was hardly their concern. I recently read an article in uh, a, a, a magazine that manicured lawns were a post-World War II phenomenon. It was, quote, the physical manifestation of the American dream. Folks, we got to dream higher than that, don't we? Don't we? Yeah. No, the disciples didn't go fishing they, to avoid cutting the grass. Most of the disciples, though, were already fishermen. Fishing was their occupation before Jesus called them to leave their boats and their nets and to follow him. Over the next three years, these former fishermen saw Jesus preach and teach and perform miracles and, and turn the established order upside down. And can't we imagine their sorrow when the, at the height of Jesus' ministry, he is arrested and he is crucified. But then, just as they were giving in to fear and confusion, Jesus appears to them undeniably alive and full of power. Jesus shows them his hands and he shows them his side. And he announces that he has conquered death. And he says to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. So why? After these amazing, amazing turn of events, do the disciples return to Galilee and go fishing? I believe the reason has a lot to do with the disciples being a lot like us. When our world is turned upside down, our first reaction is to retreat, isn't it? It's to retreat into our comfort zone. And it's not unusual under such circumstances to, to want to return to the familiar. Maybe the disciples needed time to kind of clear their heads the soothing rocking of the boat, the briny odor of the sea, the rough feel of the net, the nets in their hands once again. 
These things must have been comforting to Simon Peter and Thomas and the others. So much had happened so quickly. The disciples needed time in their comfort zone to let their thoughts and their emotions catch up with all that had happened. They needed some serious time to process. But once we retreat into our comfort zone, how tempting it can be to just stay there in our familiar, familiar surroundings. Someone once said, the most tiring exercise in the world is carrying yesterday on your back. The load of yesterday can be a heavy burden indeed. The disciples' yesterdays were were why the disciples were struggling. We struggle with our yesterdays as well. In one way or another, each of Jesus' disciples had doubted their master's words. Each had given up hope after Jesus' crucifixion. And on the night of Jesus' crucifixion, you remember that Simon Peter denied Jesus three times. Even though Jesus had predicted that, that Peter would do this threefold denial, Peter had been so certain of himself, hadn't he? He had told Jesus, though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Of course, Jesus had answered, truly I tell you, this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter had declared, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And the gospel writer John tells us that all the disciples said the same thing. Of course, later that same night, Peter would deny Jesus three times. But it wasn't just Peter. All would deny Jesus. All would run. And as a result, Peter and his friends have retreated to their comfort zone. But they aren't going to stay there for long, not if Jesus has his way. You see, Jesus calls Jesus' call on your life and on my life is always a call to leave our comfort zone. It's not unlike those inspirational sayings you maybe have seen in the workplace on some posters. Sayings like what? No pain, no gain, right? Or when the going gets tough, the tough get going, right? But so many people, even disciples of Jesus Christ, who often live their lives according to the motto, Avo uh, aim low, avoid disappointment. But Jesus Christ, he calls you and me to aim high, to live the life that we were made to live when we were made in the image of God. Jesus calls us to commitment, to head out into deep waters, to cast our nets on the other side of the boat, to move out from our comfort zones and to trust that Jesus is leading us towards something even greater than the lives that we are used to, the lives that we are even living now. Significance in life cannot be achieved without leaving our comfort zones, without stretching in God's love and grace and moving toward a higher and loftier goals and, and of giving of ourselves. The same is true after a transforming encounter with Jesus. You just can't go back to an old way of life. The Apostle Paul would write to the Galatians, a new creation is everything. A new creation is everything. We sang about a new creation, right? And he says, he wrote to the Corinthians, he says, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. 
Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. If you are not finding joy in your walk with Christ, you may be trying to live the same way that you lived before you became aware of Jesus' work in your life. Yet when you give your heart to Christ and you begin resurrection walking, you're called, we're all called, to a new way of living. The author Joseph Campbell writes, we must be willing to get rid of the life we've planned to have the life that is waiting for us. Jesus' disciples had to learn this lesson. And it would be best if we could learn that lesson too. There is the life that we have constructed for ourselves and then there is the life that God in Jesus is calling us to. And very rarely, very rarely are they the same. And so as the disciples drift along on the sea at night, catching nothing, really expecting nothing, another day is dawning. And Jesus appears to them again. And this dawn would be the time when their lives would begin to fall into place forever because the Lord was coming again to resurrect them. It is first light, and Jesus is just arriving on the scene. The disciples are in their boat about a, a hundred yards off of shore. And Jesus calls out to them, children, you have no fish, have you? And they yell back, no. And then he says, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. It's hard to know why they listened to the words of this stranger. They didn't yet know it was Jesus. But they did. They did. And they were unable to haul in the catch. They had caught so many fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved says to Peter, it is the Lord. It was a statement of recognition, but also of reverence and of awe. And when the disciples arrive at the beach, Jesus has already started a fire and a breakfast of fish and of bread. And Jesus takes the bread and he gives it to them and he takes the fish and he does the same. And the disciples' minds must have been full with the remembrance of other times when they had had meals with Jesus, but also when they had been with 5,000 or more and he had fed them another time on bread and fish. This breakfast with Jesus has significance for so many reasons, so many reasons, but I want us to think primarily about two this morning. First, Jesus had breakfast in Galilee to remind his disciples who he is, is who he said he was. He is the risen Christ. His disciples needed a reminder because what had they done? They'd gone fishing. And in such a moment of doubt and discouragement, Jesus prepares breakfast for them along the Sea of Galilee. He came to remind them that the resurrection opens a new reality. A new reality for all the world. That God is in control. That God reigns now and God will reign forever. Jesus came to remind us, to remind me, that he was who he said he was. He was the risen Messiah. For much the same reason, you and I gather on Sunday mornings for worship. 
we need reminders about whose we are. We are Christ's, aren't we? We are his children now and forever. Now, second, Jesus had breakfast in Galilee to remind his disciples that his mission is to salvage souls and that their mission is to salvage souls as well. On the night of Jesus' resurrection, Jesus had said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. The salvaging of human souls was Jesus' mission in this world. And through his ministry, he said over and over and over again, by word and deed, that he was the Son of Man and he had come to save the lost. As he traveled up and down the dusty roads of Palestine, the salvaging of souls was a driving force behind every sermon that he preached. It was behind every miracle that he performed, behind every impersonal, every personal encounter he had with men and women and children. And it was behind his willingness to face the cross of Calvary. Our Lord gave himself so completely to the work of saving and salvaging souls that he came to his disciples once again, even though they have gone fishing, to remind them and to remind us that resurrection walking is the work of salvaging souls. You see, you matter to God. Your loved ones matter to God. Our neighbors that we don't even know matter to God. Our enemies matter to God. As he traveled up and down the road, we must remember that, that he calls us to follow him as well. Jesus' question to Peter, do you love me, is addressed to you and me as well. His question is like a repetition in a poem, accruing meaning. Simon, do you love me? Simon, do you love me? Simon, do you love me? Or a song, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep where the repetition builds upon meaning and upon desire. Jesus is telling Peter and us, don't worry if you don't know about all of the things that you're supposed to do. If you don't have it all figured out, do this. Feed my sheep. That's what I did, Jesus says just as I have done for you and for others. I call you to go and to feed my sheep. And that's why I give you grace to do it in my name. Jesus' question, do you love me, and his charge of feeding and tending cannot be separated. They are really just one directive. Loving Christ and loving and tending Christ's flock are, are one and the same thing. Our lesson today is about forgiveness, isn't it? Of course, it's also clearly about resurrection. Jesus had conquered death. But he is also the one who re resurrects us, you and me. He offers us new life. He invites us to be transformed. And he calls us to resurrection walking. And we don't want to miss it. 
We don't want to miss this fuller life that God has planned for us because we're so set on the life that we plan for ourselves. Christ says, you see, to you and to me, if you love me, feed my sheep. Amen. Friends, I invite you now to join me in our litany of resurrection, which you will find in your bulletin uh, and also on the screen. Please respond with the all section. Glorious God, we celebrate with joy an empty tomb. By your resurrection, you gave us new life and freed us from sin. Because you are risen, we get a clean slate. You rescue us from our past and make us whole. By your resurrection, you raised the dead and brought us from death to life. By you are risen, abundant life is ours, both now and for eternity. By, by your resurrection, you confounded those who tried to silence the gospel. Because you are risen, the story of God's hope, love, and grace lives on. By your resurrection, you turned the disciples' mourning to joy. Because you are risen, you are a comfort in the midst of life's turmoil and trial. By your resurrection, you proclaim the salvation of God to the whole world. Because you are risen, we are made one with Christ. Hallelujah. He is risen. Amen. And now, church, my friends, we get to share in the time of the giving of our tithes and offerings. The act of sharing in a spiritual discipline together to give back to God what God has trusted to us both in our times, our gifts, and our service. So let us pray. Almighty God, we offer these gifts to you to see them used in the world and used through us here at St. Stephen's to glorify you, to show the power of your resurrection in our lives and to display that and bring that to others so that lives may be changed, so that we may never have to live in our old self again. May miracles happen through these tiny gifts so that massive things will happen in this world for you and in the lives of all, for all matter to you. Amen. My life has led me down the road so uncertain now I am left alone and I am broken trying to find my way trying to find the faith that's gone this time I know that you are holding all the answers I'm tired of losing hope and taking chances On roads that never seem To be the ones that bring me home Give me a revelation Show me what to do Cause I've been trying to find my way I haven't got Stay here, or do I need to move? Give me a revelation. I've got nothing without you. I've got nothing without you. My life has led me down the path that's ever winding.
Please stand and let's worship together. Let's go out and sing together. Isn't that what we want? Don't we want God to take us over and to take us out into the world, to share the good news, to live the life, the full life that God is calling us to? Isn't that what we want? Amen. So, sisters and brothers, our Lord and Savior goes with us. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.